This episode is brought to you by Quaker Rage Oatmeal Stout. When you're too nice to show how angry you are, have yourself a Quaker Rage. Dare you sully her name like that. Welcome to Season 3 premiere of Films and Fermentation. General applause, yes. This is episode... 57, the first episode of our third season. We are unbelievable that it's been three seasons already. We only started this eight years ago. <laughs> Not been that long. No, it's, been, it's been a little over two years since we started, and we uh, we had a shorter second season because, you know, just felt right to stop it at that point. <laughs> we had to figure out what a podcast was. Some yeah, so we had to like... figure out, like, apparently you're supposed to post them so people can listen to them. <laughs> So, so we are Films and Fermentation, a movie and alcohol podcast. I'm Leo. I'm Kevin. I'm Mike. We are three friends who like to talk shit about movies while getting shit faced. And in tonight's season three premiere episode, we are returning to a subject that we only introduced uh, a few episodes ago, but we had a lot of fun with it and we thought it would be a good way to introduce the new season. So we are revisiting films that time forgot. So this is oh, Films oh, oh. That Time Forgot, part two. Part two? Yeah, part two. Don't forget to drop yeah. us an email at filmsandfermentation at gmail.com. You can visit us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and all other social media and podcast sites. You can visit linktree.com. That's L-I-N-K-T-R-E-E dot com slash films and fermentation. That's mm-hmm. films, the word and, and fermentation all together and get all of our social media and podcast links in one convenient place. Let's do things the way we've been traditionally doing it for the last, you know, 40 Tradition. Tradition. Michael, take it away. This day in film history. In 1984, after 37 weeks, Michael Jackson's album Thriller is knocked off (laughs) As top album by the movie soundtrack, Footloose. Seriously, Footloose knocked Thriller out? Yes. <laughs> the only song I can tell you from Footloose is Footloose. <laughs> I mean, Footloose is a good album, but I, I don't think it's knocking Thriller out of the... I mean, well, that's after like, 37 mm-hmm. weeks, I think people got tired of Thriller. Yeah, I mean, but <laughs> I can tell... Man, I was driving home twice this week. Twice I heard the uh, Thriller song on this <laughs> standard radio. I'm like, are we doing, you know, Halloween and and I was gonna say, like, usually, usually, like, they play the shit out of it at Halloween time. Yeah, they do. Mm-hmm. Um, but I mean, like, you hear, there's, there's, there's other there's other songs from that album that are like so popular. I mean, Beat It's from that album. Yeah, Billy Jean's from that album. album. Yeah. Um, I mean that that's an album that has um, a million iconic songs on it, so it's it's not surprising to me that it was number one for so long. Pyt, mm-hmm. pretty young thing. Yeah, that's on there. So like, it's not it's not surprising to me that that was number one for so long. But to get knocked out by Footloose. Yeah, everybody froze. Fro- everybody froze. <laughs> oh, I don't know. We, we I, had a moment there. Your internet connection is unstable. Michael and I were fine. We were fine talking to each other. You were like, I know it's shocking to me that I got an unstable internet when I have the strongest signal possible and I'm sitting in front of the router. I had that <laughs> a few weeks ago, so I just plugged into the router. Yeah, I could do that, but then I have to go find an Ethernet wire and I'll fill like it. <laughs> um, what do you got for us on our on our beer facts for tonight? Uh, the beer fact: the proper proper glassware for beer styles. Okay. An oversized wine glass may be your best option for beers with especially complex aromatic. Aromic. Aromics. Aromatic. Aromatic. Yes, aromatics. Belgian Saison, Trappist, or Abbey beers, honey ales, and Belgian IPAs would all qualify for this specialty glassware treatment. Mm. So put those type of Beers in a wine glass so you can smell them. Yeah, I don't think I'm doing that. You know, <laughs> just telling you. I don't think I'm doing that. That's the proper glass to use with those types of beer. I like how we're doing a very visual gag <laughs> 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 on, a, on a typically audio medium. Hey, 
we're on YouTube. So I'm going to share my screen with you guys so our YouTube watchers can see this. There's your beer glass tights. Your Let me Hefe see. Hefeweizen is the first one. I've drunk out of that. Yeah, that is the uh, style that Sam mm -hmm. Adams gives you when they give you their beer glass. Yeah, yeah. And it's supposedly because of the bulb, the bulb shape at the top, you get more flavor out of it. Yep. You got your Pilsner, which is that sort of graduate. Narrow, yeah. Look. Yeah. Stange? I don't know that one. I don't know that one either. No, I have, no do I. Yeah. Then you got the Tulip Pint, which I have a couple of those. Yeah. That's that sort of like slightly bulbous shape at the top. Mm -hmm. oh, shake. I thought it was the no neck. Yeah, pint. well, you got the shaker pint. That's like a typical glass. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Your no neck pint, which is a little bulbous in the middle and then tapers back to the to the mm -hmm. shape at the top. And that one's kind of like for your, like your porters and stuff. That's why it's got like the darker color. Right. You got a snifter. That's for your fancy beers. I've had that. As well as your brandy. Uh -huh. uh, the goblet. The only one I've ever had out of a goblet is um, one of the Allagash beers. They had mm. one. It had one called like the Mad Monk or something like that. And it was Mary Monk. I don't remember. It was something Monk, but then it was from Allagash, and that came in a goblet. Then you got the tulip glass, which is like the tulip pint, but with a, a stem. Yeah. You got your flute, which is typically for champagne. I don't know what kind of beer you drink out of that. It's very, very light yellow, so it's probably like an IPA. Mm -hmm. The Pokal, which I've had that glass before. I didn't know it was called a Pokal. <laughs> the Thistle, never had that one. No. The, oh. yard, the Yard, definitely. Love the Yard. Never had the Yard. Love the Yard. <laughs> the Willie Belcher, or Belcher, Beecher. <laughs> the Tumbler, definitely had Tumblers. Definitely had Tumbler. I have a whole collection of dimpled mugs from the Cheers Bar in Boston. Those are great. Yeah. The Tankard, mm -hmm. which is your larger, uh, your 32-ounce beer. And Das Boot. Das Boot. <laughs> I actually have a boot. I have a boot as well. I, got one. I am lacking a boot. I need Here's to my go boot. out and get footwear. Here's my boot. I actually keep changing it. There's, there's loose change in my boot. <laughs> so anybody... Like the German... Um... The German ones that you had, the German, the Steins. those look like tankards. Yeah. The Steins. The Steins look like tankards. They are. They're tankards. Yeah, they're tankards. Yeah. They're just uh, they're just like a very fancy form of tankard. So like every other, so every so many weeks, I'll be giving you another glass style. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to rotate everything. I got like certain, like I got stuff on the calendar for certain beers, mm. certain breweries, uh, trivia, uh hops certain hops and glasses so it's like five or six different categories so i'm just going to rotate through them sounds good man so anybody who's listening to us on spotify or itunes or wherever you listen to the podcast if you'd like to see the beer styles uh uh graphic i just showed check out us on check us out on youtube and uh, you'll be able to see the glasses that we were just looking at uh from last show which was two weeks ago one of my lowest rated beers was a beer called lifeless eyes yes. and i was really struggling to figure out where the frig i had that beer at it was bothering me so much and then i finally figured it out it was one of the beers i sampled at the house of brews oh that's right and that was with you and megan we went to dinner that night at the house of brews mm -hmm. and and uh i had i saw it and i was like lifeless eyes that sounds interesting Hmm, here I am disappointed once again. <laughs> the glass full of lies. Glass full of lies. And I think I switched to Blue Moon or something after that. <laughs> so uh, Kevin and I, fortunately, just had spring break. Poor Mike had to still work. Although I did see you playing, uh, you were on PlayStation at like noon on like Monday. Uh, I was on Facebook <laughs> on Monday. Okay. okay. I had between, off Monday. Between I being on PlayStation, I was in the bathroom. Okay. Sitting on the pot. <laughs> you gotta get the switch so you can like play on the pot while you're like... <laughs> with the tv so, we, <laughs> so uh i yeah i happen to be home monday too because i took an extra day i have i have days i gotta like you know use up so i extended my spring break and i didn't go back to school till tuesday i think i would be I, i'd be chastised if i took a day off right now we are so yeah, understaffed i'm i'm fortunate that like the school doesn't doesn't like 
dictate my days off. It's my company and they were okay mm -hmm. with it. So, <laughs> so I took an extra day and, uh, it was, it was nice because it gave me some more time to, to binge. <laughs> so my spring break movie binge included a lot of movies. Um, I really blew through it, including watching some of my films that time forgot <laughs> to, to get, you know, reacquainted with them. But I watched, uh, so I watched Death on the Nile, which is the new uh, or the newer uh Agatha Christie movie uh, written and directed by Kenneth Branagh. Uh, not as good as Murder on the Orient Express. It was still an entertaining film, but it was a little too much on like the CGI, man. It was like, it looked like 90 CGI too. It wasn't even like good CGI. Ooh. I mean, he was still good as Perot. There were some good performances in it. There are a lot of people in the cast who are currently in like uh, controversies right now, like Army Hammer. <laughs> So it's kind of like pro uh, problematic that way. Uh, but otherwise it was okay. And then speaking of Kenneth Branagh, I watched Belfast as well, uh, which is the movie that he just won the Oscar for best uh, original screenplay. It was really good. That was a, a worthwhile watch. It was only an hour and a half. So it was a nice breezy movie. Uh, and it's basically uh, semi-autobiographical because it kind of tells his story as a child growing up in Belfast when uh, the Protestants and Catholics were really like duking mm -hmm. it out over territory. And his family was a Protestant family living in a Catholic neighborhood. And uh, the movie, like the movie opens right away with like the, the, the neighborhood getting bombed by uh, Protestant gangs. Uh, it was, it was, it had some intense moments, but it also has some pretty funny moments in it too. Judy Dench and uh, Ian McShane play his, his grandparents in it. And they're really funny. Mm -hmm. so that's a good watch that's one i would definitely recommend then i watched the bubble which is a netflix original film i watched it because it stars karen gillen and i love karen gillen from when she was on doctor who and she's great as nebula and in, in guardians of the galaxy and then i was surprised to see some of the other actors in it because uh pedro pascal from the mandalorian was in it oh. uh david duchovny is in it it's a judd apatow film so his wife is in it uh and then uh, his daughter's in it as well she plays a character and a lot of other like actors who pop up here and there throughout the film i thought it was going to be really funny and i was really disappointed mm. it was uh, a movie about actors trying to film a movie during the height of the pandemic so a lot of the jokes had to be with had to be with the fact that they were quarantined in this mansion for two weeks and how crazy they were going being quarantined in their rooms all that time and then every time they got, you know, like COVID or something, they'd have to stop shooting the film. And then how do you film a big budget green screen movie in a closed in location like that? And it had a lot of potential and then just kind of fell flat on some of the jokes. Not to mention it was over two and a half hours Ooh. and did not need to be over two and a half. I don't know what it is, but like so many movies anymore are like over two and a half hours and really don't need to be. No. And then you know, I watched Infinity War again at one point, and I'm like, God, that was the quickest two and a half hour movie I've ever watched <laughs> compared to like The Batman, which had my bladder expanding every hour. <laughs> Speaking of that, I saw The Batman. <laughs> <laughs> and as we were talking about in the pre show, uh, first two hours were very good, really fast. Colin Farrell is amazing as the Penguin. I liked Zoe Kravitz as, as uh, Selena Kyle. I thought Robert Pattinson was really good as the Batman. Uh, I didn't like his Bruce Wayne that much. I thought no. Christian, Christian Bale was a better Bruce Wayne, but he's a really good Batman. Uh, Andy Serkis was really good as Alfred. Yeah. Although I don't feel like they used him enough. I thought he could have a little, little bit of a bigger role. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the last hour dragged and dragged into a rushed ending, which is amazing. So you could have a rushed ending after three hours. Uh then I watched a movie called Titan. It's a French film about a woman who has sex with a car. I'm going to leave it there because it's really not worth talking about after that. <laughs> Is it like a sequel to her? No, it's, it's about a, yeah, I don't know. I don't know how to explain it, Mike. It's about a woman who, she gets like in a car accident as a kid and then has a steel plate put in her head. And after that, she has like this like fetish for like metal. It's a French okay. film. That's all I got to say. 
I, I watched it on a recommendation from another podcast, and I'm like, fuck, I'm never listening to that podcast again. Uh, and then because uh, I have a little bit more of an affinity for Nick Cage than Kevin does, I watched the movie Pig. That'd be and good. it was a really good movie. <laughs> and Nicolas Cage was very good in it. He was very soft-spoken, understated, and not over-the-top crazy Nick Cage. He was actually good actor Nick Cage for once. Um, it's about a man who, he was a, a high-class chef, very popular, very uh, uh, successful. His wife dies, and he becomes depressed and goes into seclusion and lives in this like cabin alone in the woods with a truffle pig. And he collects truffles using the truffle pig, sells them, you know, to this person in town and all that stuff. Then one day his pig gets stolen and he goes on a mission to find the pig. It sounds like a ridiculous plot, but it actually really works and he's really good at it. Babe, pig in the big city. Yeah, kind of like that. Yes. Someone stole his pig, he became John Wick and started killing people. <laughs> <laughs> people like were comparing it to John Wick, and I'm like, it's nothing like John Wick. He doesn't fight anybody in the film at all. <laughs> it's all, it's all, it's just, I think it's just because it's like a, a renaissance kind of role for him because it's like something he hasn't done a role where he was a really good actor for a while. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, what else did I watch? I watched The Raid and The Raid 2. These are uh, movies from Indonesia. They are martial arts films. They are two of the most fantastic martial arts films I have ever watched. Just crazy, in-your-face, unimaginable action from start to finish. Like, very little plot. Just the movie, the first movie is about a rookie cop going in with a bunch of other cops to raid this building that's run by a drug lord. That's all the setup you get. The next hour and a half are them fighting everybody in the building and trying to survive. <laughs> and it's, it's, it's amazing. It's the, the action is crazy. The second movie has more of a plot, <laughs> but it follows the same character and just kind of like amps up the action a little bit more than from the first movie. That's what they screw up on a second movie. They try to put more plot in and they just fuck it up. But this time they, it worked. Like the plot actually worked. Like it kind of, built on who the character actually was not just that he's a rookie cop it had like other things in there it was really really good two two really good movies um they don't come dubbed in english though i had to watch them in indonesian with like english subtitles but it was fine it's not like there's that much talking anyway when you're kicking people in the face i watched a whole bunch of lesser known john carpenter films um, so like not like The Thing or They Live or some of his better known ones. I watched uh, In the Mouth of Madness, uh, The Prince of Darkness, The Fog. These are all like movies that like he made in between his really good ones. And all still entertaining. And then finally, before I bore our audience any longer with my uh, free time, I learned that there is a connection between the Star Wars film, or the Star Wars universe, rather, and the movie Coda that won Best Picture. Okay. So the actor in the film who won Best Supporting Actor, the, the, he's a, a deaf actor, his name's Troy Kotzer, mm -hmm. was in the episode of The Mandalorian. He was one of the sand people that take, uh, the, that take or not Mandalorian, Bo Book of Boba Fett. He's one of the sand people that take Boba Fett in and help him after he's been, you know, released from the Sarlacc pit. Mm -hmm. He's he's got a very particular scene where he's speaking sign language to Boba Fett and teaching him sort of like the sand people sign language. Mm -hmm. And not only was it the same actor, and not only was it a dream of his to be in a Star Wars film, he created the sand people sign language dialect himself. Nice. So oh, wow. he, he put it all together. It was a really really cool like factory that I, that I had learned recently so I wanted to throw that in there and now there's three films that I really am looking forward to seeing all of them being released in the next few weeks <laughs> the first one is the unbearable weight of massive talent once again it is a Nick Cage joint <laughs> it's got Pedro uh, what's this got thing? Pedro Pascal in it oh, yeah. yeah and uh it, it just, looks it funny looks, it looks fucking bonkers it, looks funny. it does <laughs> it's Nick Cage playing Nick Cage and I remember we we talked about this in the last episode, and Kevin's like he should introduce himself as Nicholas Coppola playing Nick Cage. <laughs> Funny enough, <laughs> I think it's his niece or his nephew or something. 
there's somebody in the film with the last name Coppola who's related to him. Oh, I'm and, shocked. And uh, Kate Beckinsale's daughter is in the film. It's her, it's her movie debut. And she looks a lot like Kate Beckinsale did when she was 18 years old. Nice. Pretty, pretty amazing. Okay. Uh, I also want to see Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness. Who doesn't? After seeing the last trailer for it, I'm really jazzed about it. Um, I'm pretty sure Patrick Stewart's in it. <laughs> it really sounds like his voice in one of the trailers that I saw. Uh, the last trailer had a little bit more footage of like the uh, the zombie version of Doctor Strange. Um, it, it looks it looks like craziness, and it's it's the return of Sam Raimi to superhero films. So I'm I'm, I'm excited about that. Mm-hmm. And then the last one I'm looking forward to seeing stars Michelle Yao from our uh, Badass Women of Cinema episode. It's called Everything Everywhere All at Once, and it's a multiverse movie where she is able to tap into the talents of her her other selves and multiverses and use those talents to save the world. My cousin Michael saw that recently. Yeah, he saw he saw the movie. I think so. It's out, right? I think it's out now. I think it came out this week. Okay. So I haven't I haven't looked to see you know where it's playing yet. So, but I definitely want to check it out. He said it was very good. He said Michelle I, it, Yao. Uh, Yao. She's she's fucking great anyway. But yeah. I I it looks. I mean, from what I've seen, it looks pretty good. Mm-hmm. And then I have a little trivia here. Twelve. These are movie lines that people quote too much, or should quote more often. Let us see if you agree with this. Quote it, quote it too, too, much. too much. I'm the king, I'm of, the world king of the world from, from Titanic. Titanic. Oh, yes. Wait. Hmm? Did I freeze again? No, I got some echoey. Yeah, I, I heard myself echoing for a minute there. I, my mic's going off and on for some reason. My headphones and mic are dropping out. I think I'm good now. All right. Say that quote again. I'm the king of the world. Overused or not? It's overused. 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 Definitely overused. Uh, Underrated line. Leave the gun, take the cannoli. (laughs) Great line. Great line. I don't think used enough. (laughs) Uh, This one says overrated. You ready? Do or do not. There is no try. Fuck those people. Uh, no, I, 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 I see it all over the mastery schools. They have it posted. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I can't say that that's overrated. Come on, man. It's Empire. They said that this one is overrated. It really pisses me off because I love this line. Always. Always. <laughs> How could you say that's overrated? Uh... <laughs> Overrated from the Big Lebowski. Yeah, well, that's just like your opinion, man. I don't feel like I've heard that one no, all, often uh, enough no. to say that it's overrated. Underused, if anything. Yeah. Uh, underused one. Oh, here, overrated. You had me at hello. I think it's died out, so it's not as bad now. It was mm-hmm. back then. Mm-hmm. Underrated. I think this one is underrated because I love this line. Mike is probably not familiar with this because it comes from Elf and uh, it's the Will Ferrell movie Elf. So it's, uh, bye buddy. Hope you find your dad. <laughs> Thanks, Mr. Narwhal. Thanks, Mr. Narwhal. <laughs> I do that one. I love that one. I say that one all the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, underrated. This is Pippin from The Two Towers. The closer we are to danger, the further we are from harm. That, that, that is an underrated line. I honestly don't understand that. <laughs> Closer we are to danger, the farther small. away we are. Because they're so small, people don't see them. Oh, okay. Uh, overrated. Here's looking at you, kid. Yeah. <laughs> underrated. This is from... Uh, uh, what the hell is this? Uh, um, Bronx Tale. It's Robert De Niro talking to his son in the movie, and he says, the saddest thing in life is wasted talent. It's true. I think it's a good line. And 
what's the last one I got here? Oh, last one, overrated. This is from the movie Notting Hill. I'm just a girl standing in front of a boy asking him to love her. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I hate that movie. <laughs> so I would definitely say overrated. Oh, and there's one more for underrated. It's from The Godfather, Vito Corleone looking at the shot up body of Sonny. And he says, look how they massacred my boy. <laughs> it's a great line, I think. I don't know when I would quote it, but it's a great line. <laughs> So moving on, let's talk about some drinks tonight, gentlemen. What are you drinking? Well, I'm going to an old reliable. Mm -hmm. I am drinking uh, Blackberry Moonshine from Old Smoky with ginger ale. Mm, Blackberry Moonshine. Sounds awesome. Mm. Kev, what you got going on? Uh, so we hosted Easter on Sunday, and mm -hmm. uh, I had gone out knowing that uh, I enjoy Sam Adams. My brother-in-law enjoys Sam Adams, and uh, our future brother-in-law enjoys Sam Adams. We uh, we all decided to go with their variety pack mm -hmm. for the spring. Um, I'm drinking a Sam Adams Tropical Wheat Ale. Um, it's okay. I don't know. <laughs> I've had better tropical wheat ales, so uh, I'll say this: of uh, the Porch Rocker and the Summer Shandy or the Summer Ale. Um, and there was something else I forget what was in that variety pack, but uh, not 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 great, but not horrible. I, I love the summer ale. Mm -hmm. I think if, if I had to rank my favorite Sam Adams beers, it would be the Oktoberfest number one. Mm -hmm. Cold Snap would be number two. Mm -hmm. Summer ale would be number three. Okay. Or actually, no, number one would be the Red Brick ale that I can't get anywhere but Boston. That's right. <laughs> Followed by Oktoberfest, followed by Cold Snap, Summer Ale, and then Blueberry Hill. Blueberry Hill? I like the Blueberry Hill beer. Have you, do you like their Port Rocker? That's kind of like their lemon. Port Rocker is pretty good. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I like their spring blends. I'm not big mm -hmm. on uh, like the ale ones, but like, yeah, I, I like the Port Rocker. Mm -hmm. So I'm celebrating tonight since it's our third season premiere. That's one celebration. The other celebration is the fact that I have a bottle of Old Smoky straight bourbon tennessee whiskey right now what i'm so excited to have my to have my bourbon from old smoky so i am drinking myself little old smoky highball on the rocks nice nothing mixed in it just straight bourbon nothing wrong with mm -hmm. bourbon nice and warm in my belly <laughs> so that brings us gentlemen to our main segment yeah. Tonight, tonight we are revisiting an old favorite, like old favorite. I mean, we did it about five or six episodes ago. Yep. Mm -hmm. And it is films that time forgot. This is part D. Uh, and I guarantee you, none of you, neither of you, and probably 90% of the listening audience probably does not know the film that I chose. <laughs> it is definitely not a really popular film from the 80s. <laughs> but it is definitely one that I enjoyed enough to want to revisit it and watch it again. Okay. And had a better time than I did with the Explorers. <laughs> I had three movies in mind. I'm going with the one that I watched the most, enjoyed probably the most, uh, but you guys will probably remember it. And each one underneath kind of gets a little more, um, not vague, what's the word I'm looking for? Like a little more unfamiliar, obscure. yeah. A little more obscure at the end there. Yeah, so I gotta save those other two for another night. Yeah, so I've been, I've been, as I've been thinking of movies for this, I've been like listing them. So I have one, two, three, four, five movies so far. Where any, any time we decide to do this again, I got five movies to choose from. I got all, about five or six. all of which I watched over the break. <laughs> <laughs> no i haven't watched them all but i got like five or six in mind yeah like not counting this one reveling reveling in the fact that i got to watch these films again forcing my wife to watch at least one of them oh. <laughs> so i went first the last time we did this uh so why don't one of you guys go first tonight and we'll see if we can guess your film i'll go okay Michael, uh -huh. go ahead. mine is a 1986 comedy classic Comedy classic. Comedy classic. 1986. 
uh, starring Gene Wilder, mm-hmm. uh, Gilda Radner. Haunted Honeymoon. It is the Haunted Honeymoon. <laughs> and Dom DeLuise in drag. And Dom DeLuise in drag. <laughs> uh, it is, here, here's, here's some funny facts about it, though. It, it, it won an award. Mm-hmm. It won a Razzie mm-hmm. for Worst Supporting Actress, Dom DeLuise. Dom DeLuise, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> which, is a, uh, which, is, which is a travesty because he was fucking awesome. He was that awesome movie. in that movie. <laughs> I love that movie. I love I it. Care. That is such an underrated film. I should have started off with it this way. I'm watching a movie that I went on to the, the, the digital platforms mm-hmm. and could find it nowhere. Not yeah. even to buy. I had to go on to the to the bootleg app to watch it. I had to do it for mine too, trust me. <laughs> I mean, last time we did this, I could actually get the um the other one, but I would have to buy it for a dollar ninety nine to rent it. Yeah. But this one I could not find anywhere. Um I it was funny because like I, I had originally chosen a different movie to do tonight. And then the movie that I that I decided to go with came up on Facebook as being released on this day in whatever year it was. <laughs> So I was like, holy shit, I, I totally forgot about it. So I like totally switched around to what I was doing. But same thing, like that the movie I found was so obscure, like there was no way I could find it anywhere but <laughs> cinema HD. Some more trivia on this is this was Gilda Radner's final film. It was, yeah. She wow. she passed away from I think I think it was cancer. Mm-hmm. Um, like a couple of years after that. And she was married to, to Gene Wilder for a yeah, long time. Yeah. yeah. Um, why don't you give us a synopsis of the film? Um Let's see. Should I give you the IMDb synopsis? Sure, I'd love to hear the IMDb one. <laughs> Larry Abbott, speaker of the radio horror show of Manhattan Mystery Theater, wants to ma- wants to marry. For marriage, he takes his fiance home to the to the castle where he grew up among his eclectic relatives. His uncle decides that he needs to be cured from his neurotic speech defect, and exaggerated bursts of fear. He gives him shock therapy with palace ghosts. Mm-hmm. That's actually a pretty good synopsis for IMDb. <laughs> it, it wasn't bad. <laughs> um, I do remember, so it's like, yeah, he and Gilda Radner get married. He has these uncontrollable bouts of like anxiety and fear. Because his mother died when yeah. she was going to get married. So the idea is they're going to go to this, this mansion to get married. But his uncle is going to try to scare the fear out of him. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> some convoluted cool. thing like that. Uh, Don DeLuise plays his like rich aunt or something like that yep. in the film. And then and then like what's the twist at the end? There, it's actually a radio show. That, yeah, so it's a radio it. show within the radio the show. show. Yeah. <laughs> I remember like it is uh, one of the quotes from is like at the end, Don DeLuise uh, accidentally curses on air or something. Yeah, he, he has, and then you know, like corrects himself. <laughs> yeah, he, it was during the uh, whole Mary thing, and he says, mm-hmm. "Piss." Mm-hmm. He meant to say was "pissed" it, or something. Because like we passed, he said yeah. "piss," and then you see them in the studio afterwards. He's like, "I can't believe I said piss on the air." <laughs> <laughs> um, what, so it was made in 1986. You said, "Yep, 86." Well, I thought it was earlier than that. Yeah. That's weird. Uh, also, it, it has um, Peter Vaughn in it. Mm-hmm. You may know him. He was very. He wasn't young in this movie, but you may know him better from his role in um, Game of Thrones. He's the maester from on um, for the uh, what was that? for the main the Starks. He's okay. the old guy. The old maester. Yeah. The one that gets the shit stabbed out of him by the kids at the end yeah. of the show. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> and then in Honey, Honeymoon, he's the. Um, but the lawyer one. Mm-hmm. Don't there, isn't there like a butler character that has like his tongue cut out or something? No, the butler. No, the funny <laughs> thing about the butler was is he he's drunk half the time and he can't hear sometimes, and sometimes mm-hmm. he can hear a lot. And uh, Gene Wilder's like telling um, Gilda that his hearing comes to go. She goes, "What was that? Oh, my <laughs> fiance's hearing comes to go. I remember that." And he just yells at her the whole movie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a movie that kind of gets overshadowed by things like Clue. Yeah. And Clue is definitely a more well-known movie, but Haunted Honeymoon is 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 definitely worth a watch if you haven't seen it. It's um, 
you have anything else uh, for it, like uh, trivia or anything? Um, no, because that was the only trivia I had was uh, a Gilda Radner film. 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 Yeah. So yeah, so yeah, if you have, if you've never seen Haunted Honeymoon before, I can tell you this about it: its budget was thirteen million dollars, and it only grossed eight million. Yeah, it was a bomb. <laughs> I think it's, it's probably yeah. it's one of the reasons that like I don't think it's as well known. It it's one of those movies because like you get in the eighties, movies a lot of movies made their money back on home video. Yeah, and this was played as shit at a home uh, on HBO. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So th- this was like a big cable film because a lot of times if a movie bombed in the box office, cable cable channels could buy it cheaply, mm-hmm. and so it it would make its money back either either on HBO or on like home video or like you know Blockbuster or something like that. Mm-hmm. That's kind of why that's kind of what happens with with pretty much every single John Carpenter film that's ever been released <laughs> it made its money back on video. I've been watch I've been listening to a podcast talking about uh, Sam Raimi's films recently, and like he started out with Evil Dead, Evil Dead Two, uh, Army of Darkness, Dark Man, like all these like really like obscure films that made all their money back on on like VHS receipts. <laughs> <laughs> So, I mean, There's one thing pretty common. about the movie I forgot to mention, though. Yeah. At the beginning, when, you know, the um, Larry's cousin gets killed, mm-hmm. dressed up as the aunt. Yeah. There's a fourth wall break right there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's not what you think. Yeah. <laughs> okay. It's kind of what you think. <laughs> <laughs> Which is, I don't know. Which how you do it for break. 86. They did do a lot of fourth wall breaks then. <laughs> uh, I don't know how you do a fourth wall break when it's supposed to be a radio show, though, but. It's more of a visual medium. So, uh, Kev, do you want to uh, take yours off then? Sure. Um, mine was also a 1986 film. Oh, no. Hold on, Krisha. I lost it. Oh. Um, let me see. I'm going to go with some of the more obscure actor, actors and actresses okay. in the movie and then progressively get to the more uh, the better known ones. Sounds good. Okay. Um, Wait, what year did you say it was? 1986. 86, okay. okay. Uh, and if I could give it a genre, I'd say family oriented. Okay. Uh, so, Fred Gwynn. Okay. okay. So, Fred, Fred Gwynn, Gwynn. Fred Gwynn the, was uh, Herman Munster in Herman in Munster. Yeah. Okay. okay. A smaller role in this movie, but it's still a role. Mm-hmm. Colleen Dewhurst. Okay. I don't know who she is. No, she was in a lot of. Um, she played, um, I want to say she was in And of Green Gables okay. at the time. All right. Um, Lucy Deacons. Okay. Okay. Uh, Jay Underwood. Okay. And Fred Savage. I think that's going to be the one that might give it away. And even Fred Savage's role was smaller. The wizard. Not the wizard. No. Oh, wasn't the no. wizard, wasn't the Nintendo uh, one? No. <laughs> no, it wasn't the Nintendo one. I made everybody so, go get that fucking gauntlet. And yeah, I bought the gauntlet. <laughs> I had this the gauntlet. is. I want to say it's a Disney movie, even though it says it's produced by uh, Warner Brothers. But for some reason, I think it's a Disney. Maybe I could be wrong. I'm anyway, really struggling with it because, like, Fred Savage. The only two movies I can think of that he was in were Princess Bride and and Wizard. This was his debut film. Really young Fred Savage. Him and his sister, played by Lucy Deakins, mm-hmm. moved to a new small town, um, uh, new school and everything. They have to get used to the neighborhood. Fred Savage is getting uh, bullied or beat up by the neighborhood bullies. Lucy is not fitting in with her, uh, her her fellow students and living directly across the street or across the breezeway, I should say, the next house over, is this very odd boy named Eric, okay, played mm-hmm. by Jay Underwood. And Eric frequently... I already cheated, so I'm not going to cheat it. I looked at it and I've never seen the movie, so I, couldn't even, I wouldn't have got it anyway. Eric sits on his windowsill and puts his arms out like an airplane. And he frequently moves his arms like he's flying in the air. Okay. And he doesn't speak. He's nonverbal. 
Um, he's ostracized. His uncle, played by Fred Gwynn, uh, doesn't really have much to do with him. And we find out that uh, Eric's parents had died in a plane crash before, and he, he goes out there to try. Yeah. There's a yeah. lot going Family on film. in the fucking movie. Family, Family film. film. Family film. <laughs> so I'm like, I'm, I'm trying to. Fred Savage was also in Little Monsters. I know it wasn't that movie. No. Nope. Because <laughs> that's, that's Howie Mandel. Mm-hmm. Um, oh my God. I feel like I've seen this before. Mike, have you seen it? I know you know what the movie is. Have you seen it? You I've never seen saw it. it. That's okay. Yeah, Fred Gwynn, Fred Savage, mm-hmm. two Freds. <laughs> My two Freds. My two Freds. <laughs> <laughs> Give up. For those of you listening to the podcast, please check out the YouTube version of it so you can see all of the painful, strained faces I'm making right now trying to figure this freaking movie out. I don't know if you oh, I it, hate man. giving up. I fucking hate giving up, but I got to give up. All right. This is called The Boy Who Could Fly. Son of a bitch. It's like <laughs> the simplest it? fucking title that it could possibly be. The Boy Who Could Fly. Yes. <laughs> he's got his hands out and he's trying to fly. <laughs> Trying to fly. Yeah, I, I saw this a long time ago, yeah. and haven't seen it since. No, I, I could say I probably I, I know we I, had it recorded. I think you're I, right. I think it was a Disney film, and I watched it at least a dozen times. <laughs> you know, the boy who could fly. You would think mm-hmm. <laughs> with a simple name like that. Uh, the boy who. Could fly. Here it is, nineteen eighty six. Yeah. Oh, Jesus Christ. And yeah, and then you look I, at it; it's weird because it said the boy could fly, but the poster is of Lucy Deacons. Yeah. Staring up in the sky, <laughs> laughing like that doesn't make sense to me. And the killer for me is this kid. This mm-hmm. uh, Jay Underwood has been in so many Disney movies at this point. Like this was like not the, quite um, human. He was an mm-hmm. Uncle Buck. He was in uh, this movie. Which says it's Warner Brothers, though. So. Yeah. Yeah. So the one in... thing that stands out to me in this movie is Fred Savage riding, mm-hmm. trying to make it around the block on his uh, big wheel. Mm-hmm. Okay. And he was all military. He had his G.I. Joes. I mean, I could relate to this kid growing up. He had his G.I. Joes. They'd have battles. He'd actually bury them in the backyard. And he was ultra military. Not that I was military when I was a kid, but everybody wanted to be the soldier, you know? And he um, he constantly trying to get around the block. Uh, he'd get stopped by the neighborhood bullies and they beat him up and they, they you know, uh, punch him or whatever. Mm, so, fuck. Lucy Deacons. Like, yeah. if I remember what she looked like, I would have got the film. She was definitely an 80s crush of mine. She's the girl from Great Outdoors. Great Outdoors. Yeah. Yes. The sun falls. Mm-hmm. I'm like, God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> so Fred Savage goes around. He finally, he, he, towards the end of the movie, he braves up. He's fully armed and he goes around the block. And, um, you know, at one point they chase after him and he unleashes this whole backpack full of marbles and they all fall, you know, scatter and fall and whatnot. And then another point, um, he comes across the kid and he's very close to making it all the way around the block and the kid stops him and Fred Savage pulls out this uh, Super Soaker style gun back then and cranks it and the kid's like, what are you going to do? Hit me with, what are, what are you going to do? You think I'm afraid of water? And he goes, there's no water in this gun. It's piss and he shoots <laughs> piss at the guy. Sounds like a family film from the 80s. It is a family <laughs> film from the 80s. Wow. Uh, I am. And the boy I, could actually fly. I don't like being stumped. That pisses me off. <laughs> I'm looking at the box office for it. Oi. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it, did, it didn't do well. Well, again, it probably it got on do. cable and I overwatched it, you know? Oh, no. It didn't do well as an understatement. It cost $7 million to make it. It only made 200000 <laughs> <laughs> But it got its money back on uh, home videos. <laughs> In the hole. <laughs> He got he made his money back on all the times that Kevin watched us growing up. Yeah. <laughs> well, Lucy Deacons. Lucy Deacons, come on Lucy now. Deacons, yeah. 
So uh, I'm looking at um, taglines for the films here. So Mike, Haunted Honeymoon only has one tagline. It's yeah. dot, 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 a comedy chiller. <laughs> <laughs> the Boy Who Could Fly has three taglines. Between a silent boy and a beautiful girl lies an amazing secret. <laughs> the next tagline is wish hard enough, love long enough, and anything's possible. <laughs> Means a lot of kids fell out their window trying to fly after watching this movie. Oh, I'm going to have to tell you a trivia fact once you're done with the third tagline. <laughs> and the third tagline is a very special love, a very special magic. But is it <laughs> real magic or just an illusion? That's like <laughs> the most basic fucking tagline I've ever heard in my life. Like, that's just, is it, so is one it of a, the fun is it a movie facts. or is it real <laughs> <laughs> is it live or is it memorized <laughs> so what's um, your trivia fact on the uk cbs fox videotape of the film there's a voiceover oh, warning voiceover just warning before just the before. start of the film the boy who could fly the scenes that include flying in this film are performed by professional stunt artists observing <laughs> special safety rules under strict supervision do not in any way attempt to imitate this any of these stunts performed do not try this at home. Mm -hmm. It's like the same disclaimer they had in front of WWF matches in the 80s. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it, it was a winner for the Saturn Award for Best Fantasy Film. Mm. Also nominated for Best Performance by a Young Actor and Actress and Best Writing by the Saturn Awards. Mm -hmm. I, keep, I keep popping back on IMDb here. I have to go back on again because I want to see some more about Lucy Deacon's career. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I only know her really from these two movies. So <laughs> let's see. Lucy Deacons. There she is. Actress for the great outdoors. It's not a good sign when that's like like all the only thing that pops up are your films from the 80s. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So let's see here. So she was in uh as an actress, nine movies or nine nine credits. She was on the soap opera as the world turns. She was in The Boy Who Could Fly was her first movie. She was in a movie called Little Nikita. She was in The Great Outdoors. And then she did a movie called Cheetah. She was in an, after, an ABC after school special called Stood Up. Weren't they all? <laughs> uh, she was in a movie called There Goes My Baby. She was in a movie called, her last movie that she did was a TV movie in 1980, 1995 called A Mother's Gift. And then she did two episodes of Law and Order, one in 1993 and one in 2002. Oh, wow. She played two different characters in each episode. She played a different character. <laughs> that that is, is a lot in Law and Order. Yeah, and that's her last acting credit was 2002. Yeah. Wow. She's married and has two kids. Born in 1971, so she's not that much older than us. <laughs> <laughs> Lucy Deegan, Jesus Christ. So, anyway, do you have anything else to add about your film, man? <laughs> no. <laughs> All right. Ah, so the only thing I have I could take solace in is that I'm pretty sure neither of you are going to get my movie. <laughs> uh, All right. So, how should yeah. I do this? Should I start with like who was in it? Sure. Why not? Okay. So the movie, this movie came out in 1984. Okay. It is. I will say this. It is a science fiction film mm -hmm. uh it is a satire of the star wars films but not as good as space balls okay <laughs> it stars robert urich best known as spencer in the spencer for hire tv series the actress in the film is mary crosby best known as the daughter of bing crosby Michael D. Roberts, who is a career character actor with over 70 credits. Most of them are one-off performances in, uh, in like TV shows. Uh, Angelica Houston is in this film. And all I can say is she won the Oscar for Pritzi's Honor the year after this, so she must have lost a bet to be in this movie. <laughs> and it also stars... Wait, I have to look up the name. I forgot to put it down here. I, I know this. It stars uh, Ron Perlman in his pre-Hellboy days, and John Matuzic, who is best known as Sloth in the Goonies. Did, did I tell you what it is, Blake? You know what it is, or you, you didn't cheat, did you? I didn't cheat. What My is hands it? Right here. 
because I know Robert York. I watch a lot of his stuff. Okay. Ice Pirates. Yes, you got it. I can't believe you got it. The hell? <laughs> the Ice Pirates. The Ice Pirates. <laughs> so for this episode, I chose the far from classic sci-fi spoof, the Ice Pirates. Right. A far cry from Star Wars and not quite the successful satire that Space Wolves would be. But it's a pretty fun movie anyway. Like I said, stars Robert Urich, Mary Crosby, Michael D. Roberts, Angelica Houston, Ron Perlman, etc. The director is Stuart Raffle, best known for the following films. The Philadelphia Experiment, which is actually a pretty good movie. Mm -hmm. He's also known for Mac and Me. Oh, I love Mac and Me. Ripoff of E.T. Yep. Yep. Mannequin 2 on the move. (laughs) Hey, hey, that's Michelle Pfeiffer's role, right? <laughs> no, no, she was in Greece too. Oh, that was Greece too. That's yeah, fine. Mannequin Two on the Move was a straight to a straight to video sequel <laughs> to Mannequin, and a movie called Tammy and the T Rex. Have either of you seen that movie? No. It's it's. I must um, see. All I, oh, right now, all I saw was Kevin's forehead. So as we moved on. Ta- Tammy and the T Rex is. Oh God, what the hell's her name? She was in uh, the actress that was in Starship Troopers and and Wild Things. Uh, oh, um. She was married to Charlie Sheen. Yeah. Oh, who um, was that? Oh. <laughs> what the fuck was her name? Okay, I gotta look it up. <laughs> what was it? Tommy and the T-Rex? Tammy and the T-Rex. Tammy. Tammy and the T-Rex, 1994 film star Denise Richards. That's it. And Paul Walker, by the way. So that he that is the last, I think that's the last movie this guy directed. Tammy and the T-Rex. Uh, Denise Richards plays a girl whose boyfriend gets killed and his soul gets transported into an animatronic t-rex for some reason and she's like 15 in the film but does a strip tease at the end and it's kind of uncomfortable (laughs) so anyway getting back to the actual movie at hand ice uh ice pirates here is here's the imdb synopsis in a distant future scarce of water space pirates get caught after stealing ice from a spaceship they are sold to a princess looking for her dad. He might have found a planet abundant with water. A better <laughs> synopsis would be. <laughs> <laughs> In the far future, water is the most valuable substance. Two space pirates are captured, sold to a princess, and rec- recruited to help her find her father, who has disappeared when he found information dangerous to the rulers of the galaxy. A space opera filled with sword fights, explosions, fighting robots, monsters, bar fights, and time travel. Yep. So, like the basic idea is that in the future, water is so scarce that any water that they discover is saved in ice blocks that are transported around the galaxy on these spaceships. Mm-hmm. And ice pirates raid the ships, steal the ice, and sell it or keep it for themselves <laughs> or whatever. I'm reading so, the trivia on this, Lee. Dude, the trivia is fucking phenomenal for this. So, uh, so yeah. So, uh, as I said, um, not a great uh <laughs> satire in star wars but it was kind of like living off of that like star wars craze of the 80s at the time so it was 1984 so it's the year after return of the jedi came out and uh at, you know thinking growing up in the 80s if you were a star wars fan like i was um you didn't have a lot of star wars content no. So anytime something was compared to star wars i was watching it it's what made me watch dune in 1984 it's what made me watch this movie in 1984. <laughs> it's anything, anytime something was compared to Star Wars, I was watching it. So here is some of the trivia for it. Uh, the film was intended to be a serious sci-fi film with a $20 million budget. MGM slashed the budget to $8 million and they rewrote the script as a comedy. <laughs> kind of like, like make up for the lack of like special effects that they had in it. This is my favorite one. And Mike, you got to like this too, because it's a Gene Roddenberry quote. Uh-huh. So Gene Roddenberry, the creator of Star Trek, jokingly said that Ice Pirates was singularly responsible for bringing back the death penalty in California. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it reuses some of the set pieces from Logan's Run, which was made almost 10 years prior to this. Uh, according to one of the crew members, they... they fired the entire sound editing team mid-production and nobody knows why (laughs) (laughs) i tell you it's got some interesting like sound effects in it 
Kevin Costner was offered the main role and turned it down. <laughs> so oh God! One of the few bright spots in his career was turning this movie down. Uh, the main character is named after Jason from Jason and the Argonauts because it's yeah. supposed to be about a crew, like you know, searching for something valuable. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, <laughs> it is the final Hollywood studio film for John Carradine, who is the father of a number of Carradines who are actors. Um, <laughs> there was a minor league hockey team called the Rochester Ice Pirates that were named after this movie. It's the second movie for Ron Perlman. <laughs> uh, and it actually made money, unlike the other two movies. It, you made a little bit of money. John Matuzic went on to star as Sloth in the Goonies. Uh, a role that you wouldn't recognize him because you can't see his face in it. Uh-huh. <laughs> the film opens with this prologue. Long after the great interplanetary wars, the galaxy has gone dry. Water has become the only thing left of value. Evil Templars from the planet Mithra have gained control of this life-giving resource. Their power is now absolute, except for a few rebel pirates who survive by stealing ice from the great Templar fleets. That's how a movie fucking starts. (laughs) It's like bizarre. Uh, I I really think Angelica Houston had to have lost a bet to be in this friggin' movie. (laughs) so the movie ends with a spoiler alert or with a uh, a twist ending uh throughout the film there is talk of a world called the seventh planet that apparently has an abundance of water that would take down the empire and save everybody who is struggling to find water in the galaxy the twist ending is they find the seventh planet at the end guess what planet it is it's earth it's planet earth <laughs> It's kind of the same ending from Battlestar Galactica. Yeah. <laughs> Much better, you know, series. Uh, so this is, it's, it's a crazy ass movie, man. I am not going to say it's a good film because it really is not. <laughs> but is it one of those bad films? It's, it's like one of those watch. bad films I like to watch. And it's one <laughs> of those ones, like when I said, when I saw it on Facebook as Ice Pirates came out on this day in 1986 or 1984, whatever year it was, I was like, holy shit, the Ice Pirates? I haven't seen this movie in forever. So I watch until you start talking about it. I'm like, oh yeah, it's a bad movie, man. It's it's a bad movie, but it was a much more entertaining watch than the Explorers was. (laughs) (laughs) Here are the taglines for this movie. If if the fucking synopsis wasn't crazy enough, see a universe on the rocks, tremble at the ferocious space possums, catch space herpes. (laughs) That's the tagline. Because there's a there's an alien that gets loose on their ship, and apparently it is a form of space herpes. Yep. And that becomes like a running joke throughout the movie that they can't find a space herpes that's like running around the ship. God. C a universe on. I love the C part because it reminds me of the end of uh, of History of the World. C Hitler on ice. C Jews in space. <laughs> so the next tagline is C a universe on the rocks. C Great special effects. That's false advertisement right there. <laughs> C, Space Herpy, the love bug. They make it sound like it's something cute, and it's this disgusting worm that just runs around the ship the whole movie. C, the evil emperor and his bird. <laughs> <laughs> that can mean a couple of things there. C, action-packed action. <laughs> action-packed action. <laughs> See the American Dodgeball Association of America. <laughs> See ferocious space possums. The ferocious space possums are less ferocious than the grope that the gopher in uh, Caddyshack. And then See a totally spaced adventure. Yeah. So the third tagline is "See a totally spaced adventure," and the last tagline is "You have to be there to see it," <laughs> 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 which. I think it's I think it's safe to say it could be the tagline for any movie ever made. You have to be there to see it. <laughs> so yes, I would if you are somebody who doesn't mind the masochism of watching bad movies, Ice Pirates is definitely a movie to fucking check out. Yes. But like 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 with Haunted Honeymoon, I couldn't find a shit anywhere. <laughs> I, I don't even think it was like available to rent or buy on Amazon Prime unless, yeah. I wanted, unless I wanted to buy like an overpriced DVD which I was not doing for this movie 
Um, so I did. I found, I, I found it on on Cinema HD. So, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, definitely a movie to check out. <laughs> so I'm gonna. So thank you everybody for joining us for our season three premiere, episode fifty seven, films that time forgot, part two. Michael, do you have any beer wisdom to give us on our way out? I do. Here it is. Beer is made with hops, and hops are plants. So technically, beer is salad. <laughs> beer is a vegetable. Today's soup is beer. <laughs> Guys, do you have anything, uh, final thing to say about your drinks tonight? Uh, Most I, refreshing. Mike, I'm a little jealous because I, I know I don't have the Blackberry Moonshine. I have, um, I have, I think it's like Mountain Berry or something. It's like the raspberry one. Mm-hmm. Which is pretty good, but I like the black cherry one there. Blackberry with ginger ale, like yeah. blackberry ginger ale. I've moved on. You moved on to the summer ale, which is a much better, right. much, much better. better Sam Adams. And I have nothing bad to say about my old smoky moonshine, or not my old smoky bourbon. Uh, I wouldn't have made such a big deal about it if I didn't have anything but great things to say about it. So once again, everybody, thank you for joining us here at the. Uh, crossroads between pickled and fermented for our season three premiere join us again next week as we return with our second episode of the third season it'll be episode 58 in total next week we're getting biblical on your asses uh (laughs) in honor of the fact that uh, in honor of the fact that uh the easter season and passover season have just uh left us and uh, we will we, be concluding in two weeks. Yes, we will be doing um, uh, a show about biblical movies, movies based on stories from the Bible. Uh, good movies, bad movies, you know, our usual thing. Mm-hmm. So join us for episode 58 as we get biblical on your ass. Once again, I am Leo. I'm Kevin. I'm Mike. Don't forget to visit us at linktree.com slash films and fermentation to see all of our podcasts and social media links. Drop us a line, give us some drink suggestions, tell us what you think Mm -hmm. about the movie choices we made tonight. Maybe tell us about some of your forgotten films from the past and uh, we'll bring it up on the next episode. Uh, Thanks again for joining us. We hope you enjoyed listening to the episode as much as we enjoyed recording it for you. Cheers, everyone. Cheers. Cheers.